Hello, my name is Stefan Cartman. Welcome to my studio. Today, I'd like to talk a little bit about a string crossing exercise. Uh, this is called string crossing exercise, and it's on page 24 of an artist's guide to cello technique. The reason why I like to do this exercise is because it helps me to find anomalies in my technique. Um, what do I mean by anomalies? Well, places where I'm not loose as I go from one finger to another, or where I'm uncomfortable in my vibrato transfer from one finger to another. And so this exercise, of course, goes after all of the whole and half steps and all of the, all of the uh, interval combinations between fingers, but it does so in a very particular way. That is to say that it has to do specifically with crossing strings and how those intervals feel a little bit different. So, um, first thing I would show you is that when you go from your first to your second finger and it's a half step and you're on a single string, for instance the A string in this case, right, uh, there's a certain feeling of space between these two fingers, right? That feeling of space is altered slightly as you do, of course, when you reach across to the D string, I guess the space feels a little bit farther. And when you go from your A string and you're on your first finger, even though the interval itself of a half step between your first and second finger is the same, this feels significantly larger than the space of a half step between uh, your first and second finger when you're both fingers on the A string, or even when you have your first finger on the D string and your second finger on the A string. So this feeling of space is the thing that creates some of the anomalies and in intonation that we try to avoid. And it also creates a little awkwardness for us sometimes when we're reaching across one, from one string to another and we're doing the drop. So the idea here is to do all of the possible um, finger combinations, both ascending and descending. And that's uh, the intervals that are contained in this exercise. Um, I thought I would further mention that there's a slight feeling of uh, discomfort if you keep your hand in a rigid angle to the string. Now, we all try to keep a, a similar angle, at least, in the string, but um, we don't want to willy-nilly be changing the angle like this as we put one finger down, uh, one finger or another down. I mean, that's particularly damaging if you're trying to put your finger down, leaving the bend in the knuckle here exactly the same, and actually putting the finger down by rotating the forearm. That's a really bad idea because it changes the angle of your fingers to the strings and creates a lot more instability when it comes to trying to find notes in tune. But that said, I think there can be slight differences in the angle of the hand depending on what the interval itself is. So let me be clear about this. I want you to transfer weight from one finger to another and have a stable angle, right? But that doesn't mean that we have to have the same angle in the hand as uh, from one to two, as we do from two to four. Okay, the difference is that from two to four, if you allow your hand just a very slight cant forward like this, it's much easier to hit that interval. Now, of course, we all know that you can go from two to four and get that interval in tune. But it means when you do this that your second finger has got a more significant bend to it and your fourth finger has got more significant length when you do it that way, than if you just allow your hand a slight lean forward like this. Again, I don't want you leaning forward to put the finger down. I want that angle to be there in the first place. So as we go from one to two, my hand might be at this angle. As I go from one to three, similar. As I go from one to four, pretty similar. Right? As I go from two to four, it might be slightly tilted forward slightly. I'm exaggerating in this case right now. Okay? Now, that change of angle also coincides with something that you should consider doing as you cross strings. When you cross strings from your A string to the D string or from any high string to a low string, right? If you're going from four to one, your hand really does in this case especially need to have a slight forward tilt to it. Again, I want this to be slight. I'm exaggerating as I show it to you. Okay? And the reason is that if your fourth finger is touching the D string 
and your first finger is touching the A string, there should be there should be the possibility for both of those strings to ring clear. Now, if I leave my hand in a backward tilted posture, did you hear how the A string stopped? Well, that's because as I rotated my hand back into this position again, my fourth finger actually brushed on the A string and, and kept it from ringing. Right. So as you cross strings, there should be a slight motion in this direction and in this direction. I say this direction, I'm talking about the bend, uh, not the bend, I'm talking about my elbow's position in regard to the string. So if you're on the A string, your elbow will be in this position. If you're on the C string, okay? Now, this movement across the strings, if you leave your body very still, that motion is the largest. And if you allow some motion in your body to help compensate, compensate for this motion, for instance, if when you're on the A string, you lean a little bit to your right and allow the A string part of the cello to come up a little bit. Then when you cross string and you go over to the C string, your elbow won't have to make as much of a tilt if you lean over to the left side and bring the C string side of the cello. So, A string, C string. Right? And you can tell that both arms, the amount that they have to move is significantly less if you allow this kind of motion as you go from one part of the cello to the other. Now, of course, if we've got a lot of string crossings between the C string and the A string, of course we're going to stay very stable. We're not going to be moving back and forth like but if you've got a smooth crossover, for instance, a scale passage, or just a melody that goes bit by bit from the top part of the instrument to the low part of the instrument, it makes a lot of sense to allow a little bit of motion in here. So you'll see that I'm doing both this motion and I'm also allowing my elbow to come across as I cross strings. I'll demonstrate on uh, one and two. <laughs> Okay, now I'm reversing that. Because reaching across the strings means that you have to take the finger that you're working with and that finger has got to bend to allow the next finger to come down on the next low string. Yes, the finger is going to bend and you're going to raise your elbow at the same time. Those two things should be coordinated. You'll notice as you practice this exercise, if you're like me the first time I did it, that there are going to be certain combinations that you really have a terrible time doing with the bravo. Um, typical combinations that people have trouble with are three, two, cross, break, reaching across from three to two. For some reason, that's a big problem for, for people. The same thing going from three to four, right? right. So um, I recommend that you try to maintain a continuous vibrato going from finger to finger. I know that oftentimes people will use no vibrato if they're working on intonation. That's all well and good when you're trying to find center of the pitch. I mean, there are even some people that say that uh, vibrato is a student's method uh, to avoid hearing the intonation, although I would just pose that if you can't hear your intonation with your vibrato, there's something wrong with your vibrato. Okay? I'm just going to put that out there. Um, I think that the that the idea that you keep your vibrato continuous going for, from finger to finger is not just about producing a beautiful sound and having a more pleasant exercise to deal with in the first place, but it also has to do with finding those inconsistencies. It's typical that when somebody is stopping their vibrato as they do a certain fingering combination, whether it's from two to three, three to four, two to four as they cross strings, those are, those are typical combinations where people have trouble doing continuous vibrato. In fact, people have uh, quite a lot of problems continuing the vibrato, even just from an extension on one string 
to do the vibrato continuously. Quite often people will stop and then do their extension. Okay, that's a no-no because you can't keep continuous vibrato. You don't have an opportunity to shape your phrase uh, in a legato manner. In any case, be alert for notes that you unintentionally stop the vibrato. Listen carefully for it. And I would also suggest that while I'm doing this uh, exercise and while it's written specifically in fourth position, I would also say that you should do this very same exercise in first position. This is particularly valuable for younger students that are not yet up in positions to get the spacing between fingers in low positions is very important. In fact, I don't even assign this exercise to them in fourth position if they've been working mostly with uh, first position first position pieces from, from the Suzuki books, anything from uh, Bill Plum's experience. I would also say that for the advanced player, it's very important to do all of the possible fingering combinations in the upper register. I'm talking about I'm talking about thumb to one on a half step, right? And of course, we have uh, we have our favorite combinations in composition. So, right, I know that's the wrong key for Beethoven. It may be uh, sonata, but um, the idea here is that our our most famous and favorite combinations that we have in the repertoire are the diatonic. The whole step, whole step, half step combination that you find in a major scale, outlined in a major scale. The whole step, half step, whole step combination that you find. Well, well that's the, the whole step, half step. Right? That combination is not another typical one. So, and the third most common combination is uh, the first finger on the half step and that whole step, whole step between two. Uh, but those aren't, all, aren't the only combinations that we wind up having to use up there. And I would suggest that if you have some sort of an exercise, like the chromatic thumb position exercise that's also in this artist's guide to cello technique, then you can do all of the possible fingering combinations as you cross strings, from half steps to... exercise like that is going to allow you to find all of the possible anomalies up here. And if you add your vibrato to that and string crossings, well, you're going to get very comfortable in the upper positions and composition uh, pretty quickly. As long as you do a little bit of this every day, I think it will greatly improve your cello technique, and I hope you enjoy this exercise.